The telling of the story of the Board of Public Affairs requires that you turn back the clock to a time right after the turn of the century. The buzz on the muddy streets of Bryan focused on water and electricity. Technology was changing rapidly, and it caused some turmoil. Many people embraced the change, many did not, and everybody wondered how the change would affect their lives in the new century. Bryan residents drove their horse-drawn buggies into town to joke about the cost of electricity being sold by the bucket. The city was transitioning from gas streetlights. Running water to a Bryan kitchen sink as we know it today was still a few years away. And a three-member Bryan Board of Public Affairs was being established. I'm ahead of myself. To tell the entire story of the Bryan Board of Public Affairs, we need to start back some 60 years earlier, 1840. Villagers, to begin with, got their water from basically reservoirs that were dug in the ground and, and used surface water. But uh, Daniel Wyatt, who was one of the first settlers there in Bryan, he had a log cabin home on the south side of the square. And uh, he decided that he was going to try to dig a well. So he started working on a well and uh, was digging it uh, by hand. Um, got to the point where he had to break for the night uh, to, because it was getting dark, and he decided uh, to, to go in and go to bed. Well, when he came out in the morning, he had found that the, the water had burst up through the hard pan under the ground there and was overflowing out of the top of the, the well. So that was the first uh, fountain well in Bryan, and uh, the start of what really helped make Bryan um, get its nickname of the Fountain City. Uh, soon there were hundreds of these wells all over town. It was one of the, the real blessings of uh, the location there in Bryan was the ability to have these artesian wells, or they called them fountains, back in the 1800s. It really helped the, the town get its start because without an available water supply, the town would not have grown the way that it did. So that was the, the beginning of it, and most of the villagers were able to get wells pretty easily, uh, so uh, it was... Uh, one of those things that folks had these, just about every home had one. At one point they said there were hundreds of them there, maybe as many as 500 wells there in Bryan. And uh, the water uh, was used even to help cool uh, food, to help uh, preserve it in the days before electric refrigerators, which also was a nice thing. And uh, it was very, very good quality. You know, there was nothing that needed to be done in the way of treatment to it. It was uh, very high quality just coming out of the ground. Well, I think testing at the turn of century was probably, if it's cold and tastes good, it must be good. Some considered the artesian wells a source of wonder and believed the fountain water helped ward off illness. In fact, at the turn of the century, Brian had a mineral bathhouse for the cure of rheumatism and other ailments, located on South Main Street. And in 1906, the Brian Mineral Water Company was selling 1,500 cases per week of spark mineral water bottled from a well at the Brian Novelty Company. The Hom Brewing Company also used Bryan's fountain water in the manufacture of its fine lager beer until Williams County was voted dry in 1908. The issue that, that started the uh, water department really didn't have anything to do with drinking water or water supply. It had to do with fire protection. And back in those days, uh, the, the way that fires were fought, uh, they had what were called hook and ladder companies. And uh, <clears throat> they the city or the village of Bryan at that time, it wasn't a city yet, the village had constructed a number of fire cisterns where water during rains and things or they in some cases pumped water into them, they'd fill these up and they were located in intersections and other strategic points around the downtown area for the most part and if there was a fire then the hook and ladder company would come out there, they'd drop a hose in the cistern and initially they had a hand pumped uh, engine that they would pump water then onto the fire. Before that, before they had the cisterns, they had uh, a system of hooks where they just threw these hooks on the burning building and tore the, the building apart to try to prevent it from uh, catching fire to other uh, neighboring buildings. You know, the system wasn't a very good system. Uh, they bought a, um, a steam-powered uh, pumper, I believe in 1873. Uh, in the winter time, it was tough to get this fire pumper around town because back then the streets weren't paved and there was no such thing as snow plows and, and they'd try to grade the streets when the weather was good, but a lot of times the, the streets were described as seas of mud. So it was very difficult to get the pumper to a location in a timely manner 
And then a cistern had to be located close enough where they could drop the hose in there and pump it onto the burning building. If there wasn't a cistern nearby or they couldn't get the, uh, the steamer there, the fire pumper, then uh, there was inadequate fire protection. So what really started the movement was uh, more uh, from a, poor, or a um, perspective of fire protection as well as just the uh, improvement of the community. And it went up for a vote of the people in April of 1892, as I recall, and they needed a two-thirds majority. And they fell, I believe, 14 votes short of getting that two-thirds majority. So the bond issue went down to defeat. Within the next week or so, there were 12 or more fires that broke out in the community. So another special election was called to put the proposal uh, before the voters to issue bonds to build a waterworks plant. And this time it received the required two-thirds majority. So they were off and running on building a, a municipal waterworks plant. Uh, they built it at the site of the present uh, Bryan Power Plant. It was next to uh, the Cincinnati Northern Railroad at that time. And it had steam-powered pumps uh, just there north of uh, Wilson Street and at uh, the intersection really of Wilson and Emmett Streets, the present site of the power plant. The water plant, our water work system, was uh, started in 1892. In 1896, uh, the, the citizens voted to add an electric utility to, uh, to the city. Uh, there had been a private company before that. Uh, the citizens and the uh, city council had become dissatisfied with the rates and the service that they were providing, particularly for street lighting, and uh, decided that they would put it to a vote of the people to add uh, an electric utility. Uh, that was approved, and they added uh, some electric generating equipment to the waterworks plant where they had uh, steam boilers already that were running the waterworks pumps, and they powered those generators using the same boilers that they had been using for the waterworks plant. The problem uh, was that they kept the operation of the water system under a separate Board of Waterworks trustees while City Council ran the electric utility. And it became a problem as time went by, hiring people, uh, whenever there were purchases or upgrades that needed to be made. Obviously, uh, having both of those under one roof, there was some uh, value if you were increasing uh, the, the capacity of the boilers. And how do you divide that up as far as the cost between the electric and water when you've got separate management, basically, of those? It all kind of culminated uh, in uh, 1902 with council abolishing the Board of Waterworks trustees and taking control of both the electric and the water utilities. And uh, shortly after that, I believe the following year, 1903, there was a change in Ohio law that required uh, communities that had separate uh, municipal electric and water uh, utilities or utilities of any kind to establish a board of public service or board of public affairs to manage those. Well, Sam Folk came on board and really turned things around. Um, the electric utility before that uh, had been uh, getting complaints about people being charged different rates. They thought the rates were exorbitant. At that point, some folks were getting charged 14 cents a kilowatt hour, and uh, the equipment was going downhill. So there was a lot of concern about the management of the utility. So the, all of it was consolidated under city council, and that uh, went along for about four years. They got to the point where they were going to need to do a major expansion of the plant, because under Sam's uh, uh, leadership, the improvement in service had been so great and the reduction in cost had been good and it had created more demand for electricity. So they needed a larger plant. And in 1906, Sam was recommending that they abandon the steam-powered uh, generators that they had and instead go with what was relatively new at that time, diesel engines. They had only been invented about 10 years before by Rudolf Diesel in Germany. And so it was a sort of a bold move, but um, Sam visited all the different manufacturers and really believed 
that this was the way that they were going to be able to cut their costs for the, the community. So in the midst of uh, the public discussion about uh, changing and, and investing in the diesel concept, one of the citizens, uh, Ulysses Wynn, who was an attorney, um, filed a, a suit uh, requiring, in the Common Pleas Court there in Williams County, uh, trying to force the city council to establish a board of public affairs. And uh, it went uh, to trial, um, although his particular motion um, for a writ of mandamus was not uh, upheld by the court, the court said the city must establish a board of public affairs under the statute. And so that was really why the board was established. And the thought at the time, and I think it's still valid today, was that council deals with so many different issues and the utilities are a very technical aspect and and by having a separate board of uh, public affairs the hope was and still is I think that you try to keep the local politics out of it and it's really run as a business owned by the community and that's really what started it and it's been successful ever since that time. Sam Folk, uh, uh, his family was, uh, they lived in the West Jefferson area. They moved to Bryan in uh, the Civil War times, about 1864, 1865. And his father, William, was a, a gunsmith. Um, there are still a lot of examples of, uh, of rifles that were manufactured by Folk's gunworks in Bryan that uh, go up for auction from time to time and are in the hands of, of private collectors. So Sam grew up in the Bryan area, um, seems to have uh, kind of sowed his wild oats a little bit uh, while he was younger. He uh, left Bryan uh, at one point, I think around 1881, for a two or three months ramble with Wild Jim, uh, the, uh, the sharpshooter they, they uh, noted in the local newspaper. And then uh, Sam went to work on uh, what was then called the Lakeshore and Michigan Southern uh, Railroad. It's the same railroad that runs through Bryan today. It's, uh, uh, the Norfolk Southern line today. So he got some experience at that point uh, with steam power because the locomotives were all steam powered at that time. And uh, he served as a brakeman and a fireman and a couple of different times he received awards from the Lakeshore of uh, being the most economical and faithful in his position on the Lakeshore division there. So he uh, early on appears to have had a great mechanical aptitude and I'm sure working around his father's gun shop there where uh, precise uh, work would have been a requirement in the manufacture of these rifles, uh, that that's where he developed a lot of his skills. Uh, Sam was not, uh, not the first superintendent of the uh, light and water plant. He came on board uh, about 1902 he was hired. And at the time that Sam was hired, uh, the utilities really were in a kind of a disarray. Between 1924 and 1926, Toledo Edison Company started buying up all the small electric companies in Northwest Ohio, including Edgerton, Delta, Eden, Pettisville, and West Unity. Bryan Council gave permission to Lakeshore Power Company to sell power to the gas company in Bryan. At that time, there was some talk about selling the Bryan Municipal Light and Water Plant, but the board decided against the move, which proved to be a wise one. During the decade of the 1920s, the BPA reduced electric rates and continued to reduce rates. Things were going so well that in 1931, 25 years after starting the light plant, it was out of debt and rates were reduced again. In 1940, Sam Folk, father of the city electric plant, died. Appointed superintendent of the light and water plant in 1902, Folk devoted his life to building the municipal electric plant from its tiny beginning to one that was well known all over the United States. The Board of Public Affairs valued his service and gave him much of the credit for the outstanding success of the Bryan Municipal Light Plant. That plant acquired a big new customer in 1941 when the Aero Equipment Corporation connected its plant to the city electric lines. The factory had used Toledo Edison current. 
but with the addition of the three new Nordberg diesels to the city plant, it was able to supply Aero with the necessary amount of power. The changeover was decided on. In 1946, the city built a water tower near the Aero Corporation on West Mulberry Street. In 1948, a three-year program to modernize the city's electrical system was initiated. Towards the end of the 60s, the board determined that the current wells could supply the quantity of water needed for the city, but the quality was unsatisfactory due to the naturally occurring iron concentrations that discolored the water and stained plumbing fixtures and laundry. By the early 1970s, the old underground storage reservoir at the plant had become unsafe and was in need of replacement. To solve both problems, an iron removal water plant with a one million gallon reservoir was built and placed in operation in 1973. Another well was also bored at the Edgerton Street well field to meet future water demands. Today we do test for, we monitor the chlorine on a daily basis. There's a EPA minimum criteria that has to be met daily. Um, we monitor pH daily and we sample randomly uh, throughout the distribution system, 10 bacteria samples each month. Around 1974 or 1975, Brian stopped generating most of its electricity because it could buy it cheaper from the Toledo Edison Company, who had a lot of large coal-fired plants at that time, and coal was still much more economical and more readily available than natural gas was. So that really started the, the uh, movement toward uh, what created uh, the need for the Marquis Corridor. By 1980 or 81, Bryan had seen its power supply costs on an annual basis increase 700 percent. And a lot of that uh, came in the late 70s with a number of increases uh, from Toledo Edison. The board at that time was composed of, of Ed Kinney, who worked for General Telephone, uh, Lauren Skip Bechtel, who uh, was connected with Shuck Jewelers, and uh, John Marquis, who worked for the Aero Corporation, and uh, Leon Daggett was the uh, director of utilities. I think they finally got fed up with feeling that there wasn't anything that they could do to control their destiny, and that they continued to get, to get hammered by these, uh, in many cases, double-digit increases in wholesale power supply costs. We had such a meeting in 77 where Toledo Edison announced, I believe it was a 68% rate increase. And on the drive back, uh, the board, which was Ed Kinney, John Marcus, myself, along with the utilities director, uh, Leon Daggett, pretty well thought we had enough of, of this. Seems like every year or so we were having a rate increase from Toledo Edison. And we asked if there was any options. And I think Leon answered something like, well, we're in the territory of Tulu Edison. The only way we could get service from another utility provider would be we'd have to build a transmission line. Uh, at that time, as I said, the industry was highly regulated. So consequently, you had municipals. They just couldn't simply build a utility transmission line and hook up to another power provider. But we didn't let it rest. We told Leon to investigate it. He made some phone calls. Um, I'm sure our rate consultants and attorneys made phone calls. And we found that Ohio Power, which is now part of the American Electric Power Group, uh, would be interested in taking on the city of Bryan as a uh, customer. And the catch was we had to build a transmission line to their nearest substation, which was south of Bryan. 10 plus miles. Um, how we got there was up to us, but we had to be there. They would not help us. And the contract stated that if we were to terminate um, the contract with Tulo Edison, we had to give them notice. I think it was one year uh, notice, and at the end of that year, we had to be off the line. Well, a strange set of circumstances occurred that in around 1976, the former Cincinnati Northern Railroad uh, line that went uh, through Bryan uh, was abandoned. And so a, uh, a uh, 
right-of-way, so to speak, to build a transmission line all of a sudden became available. It did away with all the issues of getting uh, easements from many, many different land owners and gave us ownership of the line, uh, the railroad line. So it took us a few years and, and by 1981 we had all the uh, steps lined up and we had the hearings. Uh, the Siting Commission gave us permission to build the line. We terminated our contract with Toledo Edison and construction began with a deadline that uh, was, I think, June 1st in 1982. And we had to have it done, finished, and ready to be hooked up where we would be left in the dark. Um, it was a lot of people working in our benefits. Um, probably the biggest story was the substation, which often takes a year or so to build. Uh, was constructed uh, by our own employees to the most part. Uh, some of the technical uh, installations were done by uh, contractors, but our crews chipped in, worked many hours overtime, very dedicated, and our water department um, dug the footers, they helped along with the electric crew, and together the municipal utilities built the uh, substation, contractors came in, the railroad uh, line was bought, prepared and a line was built and we were done weeks in advance and it was just textbook example of, of working together and luck. Yeah, in uh, 1997 the City Council formed a Charter Review Committee and uh, from time to time they would form a Charter Review Committee. The, charter, the committee would look at the City Charter um, determine if they thought there needed to be any changes and they would take that back to the City Council and then the council would decide if it was valid or not and then they would put it to the vote um, in November of the city residents. So um, they came back in May with uh, some recommendations and one of those recommendations was to change the board from three members to five members. Uh, and the council at that time said, uh, okay, we'll make a decision in July whether this is valid or not. So they met with the Board of Public Affairs in a joint board council meeting in June and discussed the uh, going to five members. The council said that it was not any indication or any reflection upon the board members at all, that they just felt that um, there could be more oversight and more input into the Board of Public Affairs. So the, uh, um, at that meeting, some members thought this was a good idea and other members thought, well, if it's not broke, why fix it? So uh, in July then, the council decided that it was valid, so they put it up for a vote in, uh, um, in November. And the vote passed uh, by a margin of more than two to one, and uh, so then uh, we were going to become a five-member board. So on December 31st, the council appointed two new board members, and they appointed Lauren Skip Bechtel and uh, Robert Huffman. And uh, we had a much stronger board and a board that had more oversight and a board that frankly had more power than, than what the board had before. And that was really important at that time as we had just put some fiber optic up in the city and we were thinking about starting a communication utility and providing communication services and things like that. And uh, a lot of work went into that before the decision was actually made a couple years later to form the communication utility and uh, it was nice to have a five-member board. We were able to get more support from council and more support from the city, and uh, we just had more credibility, and, and, and uh, it really made a lot of sense, and, and uh, from that time on, five members, uh, it, it's been a real good thing. The owners of the power dam came to us and wanted to sell us power um, originally, and discussions led from one thing to another, and and it made more sense for us to purchase the plant. We had uh, more capital that we could use to improve the plant than what they did, and, and uh, it, it just uh, um, made sense for us to look at purchasing it, at least. So we did a feasibility study. It took us about two years of negotiating and, and working through this feasibility study. Um, everybody worked real hard. It, it wasn't an easy answer, uh, but we worked awful long hours in the evening at board meetings and uh, um, it, was, it was a really exciting time. 
another project that I was uh, involved in about that same period of time back in uh, 1995 was uh, building the JV4 transmission line. And uh, that was a project that where uh, we worked with four communities, um, Brian, Muppillier, Edgerton, and Pioneer, to uh, build a transmission line to chase brass. And at that time, you know, it was unheard of to build a transmission line into another customer and, and pick up that customer. And uh, so nobody thought that it was really going to happen. And in fact, we were up against some timelines to get it done where we had to have it done by uh, um, late October. In fact, I think it was right around Halloween that we had to have the project done. And uh, it, uh, we had to get easements. We had um, different um, line workers from the four different communities all working together. Um, we changed the route a few times during the process. It was really a, a struggle to get it done. And uh, we got the line done. Uh, we were uh, ready to energize it. Uh, we uh, had American Electric Power up there helping us with uh, energizing the, the substation because we were going to have to de-energize it from uh, Toledo Edison and then re-energize it with our, with our line and we had some help up there from American Electric Power. I saw people that were really emotional about it because of the struggle that we went through for a little more than a year just to get it built and uh, to be ready that night and you know there was a lot of people that didn't think we were going to be ready. Um, Toledo Edison had their trucks sitting along the road and uh, you know they didn't really think it was going to happen and when the lights went out and then they came back on and there was a big roar from the crowd and and you know some tears in people's eyes and things like that and it was it was really exciting that uh, you know you see something like that come to fruition it was you know again thinking outside the box the roots of the the uh, telecommunications system really started sometime before when there was a um, uh, group that was formed. It was called the Telecommunications Commission of Northwest Ohio. And it was a consortium of communities and townships that all had uh, contracts uh, for cable television with TCI, was the company at that time. And uh, they got together to try to negotiate the terms of their agreements and administer them rather than each one trying to, to deal with TCI, which was a very large corporation. Uh, as individual small communities in rural Northwest Ohio. Uh, there were a lot of things uh, as far as service and pricing that people had dissatisfaction with, but uh, the corporate offices weren't located anywhere near Bryan, so you could talk to the local folks, and uh, in some cases I'm sure there was nothing they could do about it because it was a corporate decision. In other cases, uh, the feeling was that, that they didn't want to do anything about it. And again, uh, Brian has had a real strong history of doing for itself successfully with its electric and water utilities. So as things were, were changing, we saw the electric utility industry uh, beginning to, to deregulate. Uh, I think there was that frustration with, uh, again, not being able to control the community's destiny and to be able to do things best suited to, to the city of Brian that really kind of uh, started all of that. So we had a study done um, following that that uh, showed us what we could do with cable TV, internet, um, leasing dark fiber, th those types of things. And uh, we, if you go back and look at the uh, board minutes and council minutes and at the old newspapers, we had a lot of meetings where we discussed whether or not we should get into the cable and uh, internet business and uh, communication business as a whole. The cable company that we had in town at that time had poor quality, high prices. People were complaining all the time about that. So it, it really made sense for us to, to get into the business. And uh, um, there, that's when we had the five member board and that helped us a lot too. We had to convince the council that it was the thing to do of course. And so we had a number of meetings with the city council as, as well as um, with the public. It's because we exist that we have much lower rates in, in Bryan. Uh, it's also helped economic development in the way of uh, the money stays here in Bryan. It's not going to shareholders in, in some other 
part of the state or some other part of the country. The hospital has been able to use it, the county offices have been able to use it, the uh, court system has been able to use our system and, and at much higher capacity and much lower cost than would be available from anywhere else. So I think the, the communication system that we have and the communication department has really done a lot of good for the city of Bryan. That's one of the good things about a Board of Public Affairs is they can focus on the utility issues. They don't have to worry about the fire and the police and, and the other departments, the parks and, and things like that. And, uh, um, and it also helps council members, I'm sure, because they can focus on what they need to focus on. They can focus on the, the different departments of the city and leave the utilities to a Board of Public Affairs. In my case, I really enjoyed working with the board. I had a, a great board. Uh, to work with good board members. Some of them changed over time, but uh, the thing that I found were uh, that our board members all seemed to have the community's best interests at heart. None of them had personal agendas and they were willing to take a look at things that might have even been a little bit out of the box, uh, like the telecommunication system, or if you go back to the time of the Marquis Quarter, that was really thinking out of the box and it was a big risk for them as, uh, as part-time board members to take on because if it wouldn't have been a successful venture, you know, they still have to live in the community and it's a small community. <laughs> you can't escape the, the scorn of the public if uh, a project goes awry. So there's a lot of responsibility that goes along with being a board member. I think that it's been a good relationship for Brian because over the years they have had some very, very good board members. A lot of them are local business people, uh, or uh, involved in local industry. So they really tried to bring that business sense to the board. And the, the public, of course, elects those board members. So I think that they've seen that too and tried to elect over the years good, reputable people to serve on the board. And as a result, I think they've served them very well. This is a proclamation uh, taking a lot from uh, Lou's uh, publicity in the time and Brian Times and so forth but I have a proclamation whereas 1906 to 206 represents 100 years for our Brian Board of Public Affairs and whereas Samuel Folk a leader and innovator in, in, in utilities was instrumental in our transition from steam to diesel gener generators and because of Mr. Folk we have a municipal utility here and whereas Steve K. Spare is our current director and has a five-member board Albert Horton Jr. President, Chris Conti, Vice President, Lauren Bechtel, Mary Burns, Tom Foster. Whereas public power is a, in a community is very important. Now therefore I, Douglas G. Johnson, Mayor of the City of Bryan, congratulate the Bryan Municipal Utility and the Bryan Board of Public Affairs for 100 years in our city. And I presented this last night to Council. I'd like to present it again to the Board tonight and to, to Steve. So. The vision that started in the 1800s continues to live on in the 21st century. In the beginning, area residents made jokes about buying electricity by the gallon and the inability of electric wires to be burned for energy. Today, area residents can look back over 100 years of dependable, affordable utility service, wisely guided and managed for the past 100 years by the Bryan Board of Public Affairs.